our eyes and our hearts to Your Word. May we hear what we need to hear from You. Father, we praise the name of Jesus and glorify Him as our King. <clears throat> we deserve nothing, nothing at all from You except judgment. And yet, through Christ, You have given us everything. Father, with grateful hearts, we thank you for this country, for our families, for those who are closer to us than anything, that are the greatest of friends. And Father, thank you for this church family. You are an all-sufficient God. Thank you for giving us the gift of your word and the gift of not fearing, of standing in your promises and enjoying who you are. Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly. We're here to serve you, Lord, as well as enjoy one another. Father, thank you. Speak to our hearts. May the Holy Spirit move today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ah. Oh. Good morning. What's that? Well, I remember my role is just to explain the scriptures and try to... <laughs> more I think about this, it's, it's... I want you to know God. I want you to know Christ. And, and one day when He appears in front of you, you say, Jesus, I know you. I deserve nothing. I deserve nothing, and you've given me all. And that, that, that's my purpose. And um, my calling. And I know early on in my Christian life, somebody had told me this old parable or phrase, and it said, don't be too heavenly minded for earthly good. Have you ever heard this? Nah. That's a lie. To be too heavenly minded for earthly good. You can, you can do no earthly good without being heavenly minded. And the more you are heavenly minded, the more heavenly good and kingdom changing you will be. Agreed? Agreed. And that's what Jesus is telling us with his own words. He is telling us the reality of who God is, who he is, in spite of what the world says and denies and rejects. We're here to glorify God. Bottom line. Glorify God. And we glorify him by putting weight in what he says, of believing what he says. And he gets the glory. And as I live through life, I'm seeing the world wants to steal his glory, steal his thunder, steal, steal everything. That's Satan's work. He wants to steal and oppress and keep people in bondage. And the Lord is here to free people to free us and to free those around us and we are to spread the only thing that can break the bondage and that is through Christ. That's it. And so we 
are missionaries in this world. And I remember hearing a missionary to China and somebody had asked him or said to him, you're in China, you must really love the Chinese people. He said, I really don't, but I really love my God. <laughs> and, <laughs> do you understand that? He said, I'm, I'm able to overlook their faults, their dealing, and, and love them as God has loved me. That's the essence of understanding who God is and Him working through us. And um, and, the, and Jesus is warning us not to be religious. He says, have nothing to do with the Pharisees. Have nothing to do with hypocrisy of being religious, moral, and yet no connection to God. No connection to Christ. And I, I can tell you, through my week, there's times where I just wake up in a moment and it's like, Lord, I've, I've been just a moral being of, uh, Lord, I'm not connected to you. Okay? Because the world is constantly barraging us and distracting us away from God. And I get in a religious state. That's the worst place to be of thinking, I'm... You know, the world, oh, it's so bad out there. It's terrible. And it is. I mean, it's Satan's world. As I said, they're trying to steal God's glory. The more I've been thinking about this, we've been so brainwashed with the world's thinking, growing up, in school, everything just ingrained inside of us. Just as simple as something is evolution. Okay? Okay. Uh, the facts are there. We, we've evolved from apes, and the world has evolved from amoeba. I mean, that's what they've driven down to say. Anybody who does not think in that framework is insane, is a denier in some sense. And yet, what they are doing is removing God out of the picture and taking away his glory. He created the heavens and the earth by his voice. He spoke it into being. And so they've taken away his glory in their mind. They've replaced God with science. And of course we believe in science. It's God, God made science. And it's, it's there for us to use, to use in this world to make a better life. And to work the earth, everything. But yet, that, that's just one small fraction, and I see it played out in every realm of life now. Every realm. We, as a people, as God's people, are so alien in this world, and the further the culture gets, the further we'll be alienated from it, and isolated, and standing out. Because this world is taking away God's glory, and putting it in the state, saying the government is all gloriful, they'll provide everything, um, they give you rights, when we know it's God who gives us our rights. Um, and this is Satan's way of destroying God's people, God's work. Satan has said, I will ascend to the, to the holy mount of God and declare I am God. And so his people that follow the world system are saying the same thing. That they make their own rules, they <clears throat> are removing God, and it's all for their glory. All for their convenience, and definitely to hide their sin, to justify sin in the world. Whether it is uh, the destruction of the family. God, God is... I, God has put up these protections in the world. One of them is government. Um, the government is there to punish those who have done evil. Capital punishment. If you remember the book of Romans, we studied through that. And to uh, provide for the good of the people. To honor people, citizens. Uh, to promote the good in the world. Godliness. And yet, that is distorted. Um, as I just mentioned. 
And then one of the other protections in this world is the family. Look at the destruction of the family in every different way. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a casualty of that. Of Satan knows if I can destroy the family, I can destroy everyone there. And through God's grace, we do what we can. <laughs> and know that he is bigger than Satan. Um, but whether it's the roles of men and women, gender, everything's under attack these days. And it's, if you think about it, everything that God has designed is completely under t attack. Even down to his word, it's under attack. And so we, as a godly people, we stand, we know the Lord, we know the freedom and truth behind it all. We stand firm with what we believe. And we do not approve of what the world does. We are not harsh toward it. We are not um, finger waggers. We, we are there to help people out of that oppression, that, that style, uh, and show them love, but yet standing for truth, right? And so I've, I've been working on the side thing of putting this all together, of trying to understand man's attack against God's glory. It, we need to hold fast to his truth, to his um, his word, his word, definitely, and to stay faithful. But it comes down to our relationship with Christ, with God. Um, when you're talking about stepping out at night and looking into the sky, that that's so true to see God and all of that it's ridiculous to look up at that sky and, and say there's no God that's insanity insanity um, but Jesus warns us of shallowness of hollow religion and we are to be heavenly minded people he has said this point blank now as we've been reading through Luke. Um, when we get to Luke 12 here, he's told us to stay away from the Pharisees, from false religion to shallowness, to stay clear of, of materialism, the love of money to where it's above and beyond God driving us. Um, Then he tells us, <clears throat> be ready. Be ready. Be ready. In other words, be faithful w with what I've given you. To live it out. To live by the promises I've given you. Given you and um, do not fear. Do not be afraid. Do not worry. Has that helped? Has anybody been, I know, working with anxiety and fear? We all have shocks of that and yet God is there he's that father over us saying you know I do care all you have to do is ask me I mean that, that that's key here he, he's always telling us to ask and seek him out he says you don't have because you don't ask you don't ask so keep asking keep asking um, and God will show faithful But the reality of Jesus, I, I, I just, I wanted to go back to look for something he had said back in Luke. And I started reading through Luke again. Like, Have you done that lately? Mm -mm. Go back through Luke. Things will be popping, <laughs> popping out at you as you go back and read through. Things we've covered. New things will come out again and again. I just start reading it. It's like, Lord, I, I can't contain it. It, I just get overjoyed reading. And like you said last uh, two weeks ago when I came to that point where Christ is going to be serving us at the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's like, that's beyond belief. No, Lord, you should not be doing this. I should be at your feet. And yet he says, no, I am the master. I am the giver. I am the one who will give you 
what you need because it's all by my grace. The greatest word in this world is grace, which is synonymous with Christ. It means a lot. So Jesus, the reality of him walking this earth, and then he says that he's going to die, be raised from the dead, and taken in death, rise from the dead. But he said he's coming back. And so now he's telling people to be ready, be ready, be ready. So go with me to chapter 12. And he told his disciples four things to be ready in verse 35. And, and this is all part of being heavenly minded. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That, that's key right there. Where if your mind is on what God wants, that's where your treasure, that's where you're going to be investing and I don't know, you still have your little investment sheet, your little deposit sheet? Okay. I didn't see anything come through in the bank, so that's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, but that is, that is investing in God's kingdom, his, our, our kingdom with him. And um, he told us to be dressed, ready for service, that, that we are doing our king's work, and keep your lamps burning. We're not in darkness. So that's the first thing. Um, well, no, the first thing was be dressed. Have your loins girded. That means you're ready to run. You're ready to go, ready for service. Secondly, keep your lamps burning. You are not walking in darkness. You're children of the light, living by the light, and not hiding sin. You confess sin and um, walking in the Spirit. And we're... Thirdly, like men waiting for their master return from a wedding banquet. When the master leaves the house, we don't know when he's going to return. It could be days, it could be a week. But when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It'll be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. We'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. The master is serving. And it will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. So when he's completely unexpected, in the late night hours, that servant's there ready to open the door, ready to greet, can't wait for him the master to come home. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So it, it's going to be unexpected. He's saying when I come back, it is an expected return, but at an unexpected hour. So when he returns, it will be like a thief. So we will have to be attentive to that. So you all also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. Okay. Do you believe that Christ is coming back? Do you? Yes. He says it right here. He said it right there. Now, verse 41. Peter speaks up. And he asks, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? So, we have to ask yourself, why is Peter asking this? Why is he asking this? Are, are you talking to everybody to be ready or just us be ready? And there's, there's, a, there's a hint of danger in this because if you're not ready, something could happen. Um, because we see that it will be good for those who are ready. And really there's not anything about not being ready here um, <clears throat> so far. So he, he's, he's trying to clarify 
what Jesus is talking about as well as who he's talking to. Are we ready? Are we supposed to be ready? Is everybody going to be ready? Who knows? But the Lord answered, and, and he doesn't give a direct answer here. It's an indirect parable he gives. And the Lord saying, who then is the faithful and wise manager? So he wants to clarify and make it clear who is faithful and wise. It is those who are ready and prepared, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. So, who is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of a servant? Jesus always loves to use the master and the servants in, in all of these different parables, whether it's you know, giving the talents to the servants, whether it's um, leaving them in charge. Many times in Mark, Mark 13 is one, Matthew um, 24, Matthew 10, different accounts where Jesus is using the master and the servant. And of course, it's usually the Lord who is the master. But here he's saying, who is going to be out there? Who will be a manager who the master puts them in charge of other servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. So when the master leaves, he's putting someone in charge. And Jesus is saying, it's you. It's everyone who is listening to this message. And there's going to be two responses to that stewardship or uh, a responsibility. And in verse 43, he says, it will be good, it will be a blessing for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. And really, this is a major biblical truth here. He's talking about those who are faithful that seek the Lord, follow him, do his will. God has promised that he will give us his kingdom. Not a part of his kingdom, the whole thing. You will be co-heirs, co -heirs, co regents with Christ in the future. So that's the people that are ready. They're faithful. The other side, 45, but suppose the servant says to, my, to himself, my master's taking a long time in coming, and... He then begins to beat the man, man servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. So he defiantly goes against the master's commands. Defiant. And the reason I brought that up in the beginning, when, when we see in the world outright defiance against God's laws, the way he's made, designed everything, whether it's family, gender, same sex, whatever, abortion, going against God defiantly, we're, we're seeing that here. It's a person's heart of saying, I don't care what the master says, I'm doing what I want. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware of. And he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. That's pretty severe. <laughs> That's not just firing the servant. Cutting, to, cutting him to pieces. This, this is pretty tough language. And he's saying, um, when I come there and, and a servant um, 
these servants aren't necessarily believers. So we have to look at this parable because Jesus brings in this word unbelievers, that servant is matched with unbelievers, right? So this is talking about all people who are servants. All people in this world are accountable to God, whether they believe in Him or not. He's created all things. He's created all mankind. They have an obligation to God to keep His law, to keep to glorify Him, and yet none of us can. We're unrighteous, but we still owe God that. And all people are accountable to God. And so... Some people in this world, Jesus is saying, is not, are going to be defiant against their master, the Lord. And there is punishment in that. Um, it's not going to be just overlooked. It's going to be dealt with in an extreme way. And then verse 47, it goes on. So we have first... The, man, uh, the servant who is faithful will be blessed. They're in that place of blessing, in safety, in not fearing and, and not worrying, and that place in the Father's hand. And then the rest of this is about punishment of those who, number one, are defiant. And then in verse 47, it says, that servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. Okay? That's not as bad as being cut up into pieces, but it's still punishment. Okay? They're being beaten with many blows. And this is the person who is apathetic, indifferent. It's like, eh, I, I know better, but that's all right. I, I don't really care. So it's not outright defiance. It is sarah, sarah, whatever. I don't, I don't really care. Um, and so there's consequences to his action, their action. Verse 48, but the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. So this is the ignorant. The one who really doesn't understand or doesn't, hasn't had a lot of exposure, but um, they're accountable for what they do have and what they do know. All people are accountable in one way or another. Um, in Romans 1, it says that God created the heavens and earth and they declare who he is, that there is a God. He's putting the law in people's hearts throughout the world that there is a wrong and a right, a moral. And people are held accountable to that. No matter what. Um, that's why it goes on. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And so these are levels of punishment okay, for those who ignore the readiness of believing in Christ and realizing he's coming. And so Jesus is doing the dividing line here again. For the narrow gate, the wide gate, saying those who are ready and know me, nothing to fear. It's blessing. Um, but for those who don't, he's already talked about hell. And is there degrees of punishment in hell? I would pull from this right here. There is. Um, any degree would be terrible. I, no matter what. Um, but that's the Lord's, that's His business. I'm not God. I don't understand this. But that's His, He's telling people, you're, you're going to be held to an account. All things. But He's telling us this as His followers. You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed doing the Master's work. Just, just be ready. Just 
live your life as every day Christ could come back. And every Christian from the time after Christ, when the church began, have been waiting for Christ's return. And it's always been eminent, at hand. And He's called us to live this way. To live this way. Um, and so, do, do you think He answered Peter's question there? He did. He did. And Peter... You know, I, I can't I can't completely understand. I've read different commentaries on this and nobody's really nobody knows what Peter was thinking here. I don't what he was really asking, is he talking to everyone or to to us, to his close group? Because remember there's ten thousand people there. And then he started talking to the small flock, disciples, those who were open to hearing him. And <clears throat> And so I don't know if Peter was talking about us close people with you, um, but there had to have been a fear factor. Are we the ones that aren't going to be ready? And I, he explains it here. That um, if you're doing my will, um, I, it'll, it makes real big sense. Real large sense. It makes most sense if we keep reading to the next verse on 49. Where he says, I, there's a lot in this too. I don't even want to start these verses. But he says, I have come to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is completed. So, well, keep reading there. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They'll div be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Okay? He's saying I'm 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 coming here to divide the world in half. I've come to bring a sword, he says in another gospel. The same thing as division. I'm I'm cutting the world in half. All people <coughs> and there are going to be the faithful and there's going to be the unfaithful. And when he says this about, we understand what this means, right? When, when you take the gospel in, you create a new cre creation, you see God's purposes, plans, you understand his word, and it's diametrically opposed to the world, and that resistance, go, I mean that animosity goes up right there. The world hates God, hates Christ. Even though they may think they love God, they don't know Him. And so that, that clash is going to be there. Um, you know, when I became a Christian, I called one of my good friends and told him all about Christ. <laughs> okay, there, there's a division there. Um, Light has come into the world. The world loves darkness. Okay? And they hate us because they hate Christ. And um, so Jesus is saying this is normal. This is normal. People are, are not going to understand. They're going to hate you for reasons they don't know. But understand from your point of view you see them for who they are um, because Christ now has given us new eyes to see the world to see people and not when they do stuff to us we don't look at them as the bad guy I mean as evil that we need to stamp them out and revenge on them 
No, we understand they hate us because that's what they're directed to do by the world and the satanic system there. Um, so we love on them. This is God's way. I mean, we still hold our line of truth, what's right. We don't just jump in with them and say, oh, it's all oh, good. I love you no matter what you do. No. There's consequences to what you do. I want to help you out of it if you see what you're in. Right? We deal with people in our families and friends that get involved in stuff. We still love them, but we don't want them to participate. We don't want to participate. We want to pull them out of that bondage. Let them see that it is bondage. Come to a knowledge of it. And pray. Ask God to release them. Please release them. Um, and so, with Jesus saying that part, it reminds me later when Peter says, Lord, uh, we've done everything to follow you. We've left families, wives, friends to follow you. And Jesus told them, your reward in heaven will be greater than what you can even understand. And this, this Peter's like, I, I, I'm rejected from who... My, my life where I used to live. I mean, Matthew, just think of him. He can't have anything to do with the old establishment of tax collecting in that part. Um, but he still had friends that he was trying to lead to the Lord when he had the party. But with Peter asking the question, I think Jesus, by saying... You're seeing opposition, and it's because you're, you're faithful to me. You're faithful to me. There, there's going to be divisions. There's going to be um, people that are not going to agree with you at all. Um, but you are a faithful servant. Um, because you have denied yourself, taken up your cross, and followed me. You, you could die following me. Your life is threatened, but you still do. So, do you, do you, do you see that at all? Okay. Um, I skimmed past that part um, with Jesus saying, I've come to bring fire on the earth and how much I wish it were already kindled. He's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing... Something that is going to be so offensive into this world. The message of the gospel will be offensive. And it's going to bring fire. It's going to bring turmoil in the world. He's not bringing peace when he comes his first time. He's bringing... He's bringing grace and mercy, and yet he's bringing accountability for those who will not turn to him. Uh, this goes against what the world thinks of Jesus of you know we're all Jesus love binding together and tolerance for anything <laughs> that's the way we, we're made to feel now Jesus you, you just be tolerant of anything anybody does they're living their truth in their way the way they want to live and who are we to say anything different? No, that's not what Christ is saying here. I've come to bring a sword. And, it, and it's going to hurt. It, it's going to divide people. And he's like, I'm, I've come to bring fire in the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Um, there's a lot in that statement. He's, he knows right in the very next verse, but I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's completed. This is the same word, et pedalastai, that it is finished on the cross. So he's talking about, I'm, I'm distressed now. He's distressed through his life about what's coming. He knows what the end game is. Ever since 
He was a young man. He knew I came into the world to die. To, to be that lightning rod of God's judgment for all people. And he's saying, I live with that in my mind. And he says, I know I have to go through the baptism of being identified with suffering. That's what baptized means. And being identified under God's judgment and wrath at the end. Um, but he's waiting. He's, he's like, I'm ready for it to be completed. I'm ready. I'm ready for it to be finished in God's time, but I'm, I'm ready for that. And I've come to bring fire on the earth. Um, we know his first one was, Jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. His second return is coming in fire and judgment for those who do not know him. That, that goes with, he's coming back to the earth to release judgment on those who are unfaithful in that sense of having the knowledge of God and not doing anything. They're either ignorant, indifferent, or defiant of Christ. Um, he has not come to bring peace on the earth. He's coming his second time to bring peace on the earth. It's the only way the world will know peace is through Christ reigning in Jerusalem on this earth. Only way. Only way. Um, he's come to bring peace. The peace that we have with God. Restoring peace between man and God. And, and relationships with people of, of this right here is peace. We have peace here. We have God involved. We have friendship, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is where we see a glimmer of peace, of the glory of the kingdom. Um, and Jesus is saying that he is returning. And um, I, had mentioned, I had written down different Jesus has to return. He has to. Because God promised it. In his word, Psalm 2 um, talks about his son coming. Psalm. This is David writing the Psalms. Second Psalm. It talks about Jesus coming to the earth um, and ruling with a rod of iron, of, of true justice and peace in the world with him ruling. Christ promised his coming many, many times. Uh, the Holy Spirit has testified through his scriptures of Christ's coming. Um, the whole future of the church is dependent on it. Titus 2.13 says that we look for the blessed hope of Christ's return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we went over the three different verses last week, or two weeks ago. John um, 14, where it says that Jesus told his disciples, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back, and I'm taking you to a place where I am. A place of blessing. That, that's separate. The rapture and the church, that's all part of blessing. Um, and then 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 talked about how when Christ returns for his church that people will be gathered and meet him in the air to be taken with him to the Bama Seat of Christ and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Um, 
And we know that his return is inevitable because of the cor corruption of this world. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And the only resolution to it is Jesus coming back one day. Because Satan doesn't have the last word. He's going to be judged. And his judgment has been proclaimed by God of being cast into the lake of fire. So that demands Christ's return as well as this world crying out, moaning and groaning. Remember that in Romans? How the earth is crying and groaning? It's been corrupted. This world is waiting for the Son of Man to be revealed and the sons of man, us to be revealed with Him. And so the rocks are going to cry out and the trees. And <laughs> that, that's the way to say all creation has been affected by sin. Um, and it will be made right when Christ comes back. And then the covenant with Israel demands it. Romans 11 says that all Israel will be saved. All the promises of the Old Testament of them being God's nation in the world... Um, is yet to come and the nation of Israel will be saved during the tribulation before Christ comes back. They will see the one they have pierced. That's from Zechariah chapter 12. It says they, the nation of Israel, will look on the one they have pierced, the one they have killed and hung on the cross, and grieve and mourn. And they will put their trust in Christ. The nation of Israel one day will do that. So, Paul tells us in closing, Romans 13, I guess I'm hitting Romans a lot here. Romans 13, verse 11, he concludes his writing by saying, and do all this understanding the present time the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. This is the thing. Wake up. Be ready. Be alert. Be attentive. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. This salvation that we've had, we've come to Christ, been made a new creation, we're being sanctified in our life, um, purified by God, through trials, tribulations, and, and drawing closer to Him during that time. But the ultimate part of salvation is standing before Him. And that day is closer than it has been in the past. He said, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Take Him on in part of you and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. So we're, we're called to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is having a heavenly mindset so that we can do earthly good. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all you've done, that you've revealed yourself to us, that you've expressed Exposed yourself to us and revealed yourself in this world and in this nation where your word is so prevalent even though darkness is closing in your word is still here and Father we hear it we open our, our eyes to it and we see Christ Father may we magnify and glorify him And be open to talk about our King. That He is my King. My sovereign King over my life. And so Father, daily may I 
yield myself to my King. Every day this week, may I remind, remind myself in the morning to say, Lord, all is yours. How may I serve you? How may I be a faithful servant to be ready and watchful? Father, may we have, I ask you for more and more wisdom that draws us closer to you, that makes you the complete reality in our life that overshadows the passing <clears throat> problems that we have, that you get us through those and reach people with the message of the liberating gospel of Christ. Thank you for entrusting us with that. In Jesus' wonderful name, everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you.